just come back from Timor. Timor is a wonderful place with great people and with great needs. Um, this time I took a whole group of our education specialists up to do some work with the teachers and administration in, in Maliana. Maliana is right up on the West Timor border, quite near Indonesia. And uh, it's about a five hour trip from Dili uh, on wicked roads. Uh, you know, you bounce your way for five hours up there. And uh, it's worth it all to be there, really. But you can imagine after a really dusty ride up there, I was uh, desperate for a shower. And so I was hoping that whatever room or rooms we were in might have a shower. And uh, I was delighted when I uh, went in and there's, there's a shower, I thought, terrific. And so when I got a chance, I stripped off and into the shower, uh, terrific. And uh, turned on the tap, naught. Niente, nihil, nothing. And uh, not only was it not hot water, it was no water. <laughs> and so I quietly got back into my togs and uh, went about my business. Uh, the water was turned on for just a little while during, during the day. And I think you learn great things from them. I mean, one, you obviously learn how much for granted we take the things that are around us. Uh, in, in our affluent uh, country. Uh, if it's not hot water, we're pretty angry about it. Um, and if it's not soft towels, we're pretty angry about it, and so on. So you learn that. But I must say one of the more profound things for me was I learned that doesn't, I mean, all the pipes were there, the taps were quite shiny, you know, it was, they were terrific. The only thing is there was no water coming out of them, which seemed to defeat the purpose of it a bit. And it seems to me that that's the way we are sometimes with the church. You know, that the structure's all there. It's all in place. It's all meant to, to do what it's meant to do. But sometimes there's no water. And so there's no life. Uh, it doesn't matter how good the structure is. As I say, this particular place where I was, I think the structure was pretty good. I don't think you could blame the structure. The fact was there's just no water coming through the rotten thing. And so I've thought a bit about that. And uh, I was thinking too, you know, about the uh, anniversary of, of uh, World Youth Day is coming up, particularly in Krakow, and John Paul II, the great uh, designer, dreamer of uh, World Youth Days, because he wanted to meet young people from around the world, was what he said. And uh, I suppose I was led on to think about how, how do we take that analogy uh, to become the water, the life-giving water, that makes all this structure what it's meant to be. And I remember John Paul II in 2000 when I was in Rome with uh, a group from the Diocese of Port Pirie then, um, and I've shared this with many of our own young people, I was enormously excited and impressed with the man. I'm sure he'd be pleased to hear I was impressed with him, but I mean, I was enormously impressed with him and later had the pleasure of meeting him. And that night, it was just a fantastic experience. We're at the vigil in Tor Vergata outside Rome, probably four or five million young people. And uh, there were lots of presentations to him, and then eventually, you know, he started to talk. And uh, all the kind of South Americans and whatnot would start up, you know, yo, Paolo. <laughs> You've got to get a million or so doing that and you've got to stop. 
And so not only did he stop, but he was smiling and with his one good hand, he was starting to tap in time with the whole thing. So they went bunter really. And then all the English mobs started up. John Paul too, we love you. So it was just chaotic, the whole thing. He never said, look, quiet and down, I've got something to say to you. He just loved it. And in the end, he said, look, and this is the point I think about this water and the structure. He diverted from his, he said, look, tonight has been fantastic. He said, it was meant to be a, a monologue. I was supposed to talk and you were supposed to listen. He said, it hadn't happened that way. He said, because of your goodness and your heart, it's become a dialogue. And you've made the old heart of the Pope young again. You know, that life-giving water thing. And then he got really kind of intense. He said, it's been wonderful. He said, but you've got to go back now after these wonderful days. And he said, you've got to go back to your own places and you've got to create a new civilization. And he said, it's got to be a civilization of love. And then he said, this will not be easy. And then he quite deliberately and intensely said, but I know you can do it, he said, because you know and I know that you have a heart for love and a passion for justice. And four million young people went, yes, somebody understands us. This old man understands our passion and our desire to be good. And I've just always resonated with that. That you are the young heart of the church. Not the church of the future, which you so often hear people receive, you know, talking to young people, they say, it's really important you do this and that because you're the church of the future. It's always amazed me. I'm never sure what birthday you become part of the church. <laughs> I mean, 25, now I'm part of the church. Or 35 or 75, I don't know. We're part of the church by baptism. And as Pope John Paul II said, you are the young heart of the church, which has all sorts of repercussions, I think, doesn't it? This structure that's all there, if it's gonna work, it needs people pumping water through it at an enormous pressure. You turn on the tap and it goes, Shh. hot water, Shh. cold water, it's all there because the structure's there, but we need to give it life. And when people look at the church, they don't want to know what the bishop wears or said or did. They want to know, what is my mate who's a Catholic? How does he live his life? How does she live her life? They look at you and they say, because you're the kind of the, the Bible of, the, of Christ. You are the catechism of the church. Nobody's going to go into the St. Paul's bookshop, pick up a catechism and say, oh, that's beautiful, I want to become a Catholic. They'll become a Catholic because they've been inspired by you. When they turn on the tap, the abundant life-giving water. And I just think that we're so lucky in, uh, in Australia, you know, to have had this period of my life anyway, which as a bishop has been shaped so much by World Youth Days and the extraordinary work of young people in the diocese where I've been. Uh, just amazing and inspirational. Uh, and it makes you want to get up in the morning uh, to, to do something. And finally, I'd just say this, you know that psychologists, particularly good psychologists, and some are good, uh, <laughs> and, and some are not so good. But good psychologists like John Powell, the Jesuit priest, who's a, was an enormous mentor of mine, and, and, and I actually went from England just to see him once in America. He says that the way we vision things, the way we see things, will actually dictate our emotional response. It dictates it. It, it makes it happen. And he says, like, if you, 
if you see a person coming and there's somebody that you don't like very much, you think, oh God, here they come now, I'm going to be stuck with them. Why didn't I see them earlier and could have ducked around the corner? And you're just miserable about it. Another person looks at the same person and says, oh, here comes Fred. Like he's off the wall, but he's wonderful to talk to. He's got a million ideas. Oh, I can't wait to see Fred. And we're really looking forward, waiting for him to come up. The other person's ducking around and thinking, oh, God's ruined my day and all of that. And so it's, he says that way we see God or the church or myself, how we see ourselves dictates how we respond emotionally. And when we look at the world in which we live uh, and the passion and the heart for love that young people have in the church, I think we're excited. We're excited, we're confident, we can see the future, we can see God in the people around us and in what's happening, we can see the tragedies and we want to do something about it. And that's what you offer to the church. As he said, you are the young heart of the church. You make it alive. The other side of that is that we as bishops and priests need to listen carefully to your heart. The Holy Spirit inspires you and gives you wisdom. But he also gives you passion. And we as bishops and priests and those who often kind of make decisions for the church in a way, need to listen really, really carefully to you. Not only to what you say, but to your own heart. Because as John Paul II said, you are the young heart of the church.